If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians, we began last week with a background sermon on the book of Philippians, specifically from Acts chapter 16. And as I mentioned last week, Philippians is one of the healthier churches having received a letter from the Apostle Paul within the New Testament. And when I think about healthy churches, they typically have healthy leadership. Healthy churches typically uh, reflect uh, a healthy leadership. And I think that those of us who have been within a local congregation for some time would certainly affirm how important it is for churches to have spiritually healthy leadership and a healthy leadership structure. You see, too often we hear horror stories of how churches split, how churches divide, or how churches have been torn apart because of failures in leadership. And we all can tell stories of that. But thankfully, when it comes to the church leadership structure, you and I are not left on our own to figure out what God's will and plan is for his church as it relates to the way God would have his church to function. You see, the New Testament clearly speaks to church leadership. It clearly speaks to the function of church leadership and God's desire for his church through leadership. And as we begin this letter in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 specifically, we see the two offices within the church addressed. We see overseers and we see deacons. Now, generally, Paul greets each congregation by addressing the congregation as a whole, by by addressing the brothers and sisters, the church as a whole. But in this instance, he specifically addresses overseers and deacons. Now, I'm stopping here at this point today uh, to address these two offices because I think that understanding what the Bible says about these two offices, what they are, how they function, and how they relate to one another and the congregation are of paramount importance for us. You see, what we see here is God's will for His church as it pertains to leadership. And when I say that, I mean that God wills for the offices of elder and deacon to be established within his church and function the way that he has set up for them to function. And these offices are addressed over and over within Scripture, and they are certainly relevant and important for us today in the church of Christ. Now, right now, you may be thinking to yourself, I'm about to be bored out of my mind listening to a sermon on church leadership. (laughs) Rightfully so. Or, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a deacon, so what does this have to do with me? Why would would I be concerned about this? Well, uh, my response to these very valid questions, by the way, very, uh, very valid question, would be that if you're a member of this church, or any church for that matter, then this has everything to do with you. Understanding church leadership and what it is and and developing a healthy church leadership has everything to do with the congregation as a whole. And we've said numerous times that we want spiritual revival and revitalization here at First Baptist Olo, and we certainly do. And if this is true, if we really desire this, if we really want this, that means looking around at our church and asking ourselves, do we align with God's word? In every area? Do we align with the Word of God? And if we want, this is no different as it pertains to leadership, church leadership, and if we want to see God revitalize our church, it is necessary that we align our church leadership with God's Word, with His prescription for us. You see, God's Word, the Bible, does not provide suggestions for how he would like for his church to function. God's word provides a blueprint for the way he would have his church to function. Therefore, if we want spiritual revival and church revitalization, us as a whole, God's church, Christ's church at First Baptist Olo, must evaluate what God's word says about our leadership and leadership, our leadership structure, in order to see where we need to align to best reflect God's plan for his church. And so today is extremely relevant and extremely important for us as a body of believers at First Baptist 
Olo, as a congregation, as we consider this invaluable topic. And so if you would, would you stand as we read Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. And God, we love what you love. And you love your church so much that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for your church. And so, God, as we seek you and as we seek revitalization and as we seek revival in your church at First Baptist Olo, God, would we align ourselves with your word in every area and see you pour out your blessings upon us as you already have in so many ways. And so, God, I pray that as we discuss your will for church leadership, God, that we would receive it that we would be stretched, that we may learn, and that we would yield to your word. Your word is our source of authority. Your son, Jesus Christ, is our source of authority, as this is his church. And it's him we seek this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So as we discovered last week, Paul is writing this letter to the Philippian church that the Lord started through Paul in Philippi, a Roman colony. And Paul is writing this letter 12 years after founding the Philippian church, which we saw in Acts chapter uh, 16, presumably from prison. And so the church at Philippi began through the conversion of a woman named Lydia. And as I mentioned last week as well, it appears that the the Philippian congregation, I mentioned this earlier, is one of the healthier congregations under the watch of Paul. We've read some of Paul's letters and, and, and writing to some of these unhealthier churches, and Philippi is not one of those. And so as I mentioned, this This is the only letter in which Paul addresses the church leadership within the greeting, overseers and deacons. And he does this because he knows the leadership of this church. He has a relationship with the, with the leadership of this church and this, and this church, and he trusts the leadership of the church at, at Philippi to steward and shepherd Christ's church well for the overall health of the church as they carry out what began in Acts chapter 16. And so Paul's desire for the Philippian church in all churches was for the church to thrive and for the church to be spiritually healthy, both of which are possible when godly elders and deacons carry out their specific God-given roles within the church. And so with this being said, we're going to look at what Scripture says about overseers and deacons. We're going to consider what God's Word says about these offices and how they function within the church and why God has established them the way He has. Now, let me say this. What I'm about to do is give a broad overview Very broad, because most of us have questions and may still have questions that we will for sure after this is completed. We don't have the time. We Well, we could, really, if y'all want to stay a couple hours to spend some time in this. But this is a broad overview. This will not answer all of our questions, nor be as in-depth as we may like, but it will provide a general analysis of God's plan for his church and leadership and what Paul means when he addresses the overseers and deacons, who they are, how they function, and why they've been set up the way they have. And so the first observation I want to make uh, when considering uh, leadership is the New Testament way of church leadership for the health of the church. The New Testament way of church leadership for the health of the church. Now, within the New Testament... Church leadership is given, given several different names, including the two offices we read here. You see elders, you see overseers and bishops, you see pastors or shepherds mentioned, and you see deacons. These are the primary offices you see within the New Testament. And as we see in this verse, Paul uses the, uh, the term overseers and deacons. You see, the term overseer is another word for elder. Elder is the most common New Testament word indicating those who are pastoring the church or specific to this text, the overseers of the church. 
And so throughout the New Testament, elder and overseer are used interchangeably representing the same office. And one specific example pointing to the interchangeable terms are the qualifications for elders provided in 1 Timothy and then provided in Titus chapter 1. You see, Paul, the author of both of these letters, 1 Timothy and Titus, addresses the overseers in 1 Timothy and the elders in Titus, listing the same qualifications for both. They're never spoken of as a different office and have the same function. And so elders are given the task of ruling and leading and teaching the church of God. Now, although the word pastor, surprisingly, is only used uh, in the official sense one time in the New Testament, and we adopted that term most common, pastor, which is fine, it is also used interchangeably representing the same office as elder, the same position. But if you notice within this passage, as well as every other passage in the New Testament addressing church leadership, the term is always used in the plural sense. Here in Philippians 1.1, he says overseers, plural. Always in the New Testament, you see this term elders, overseers, used in the plural sense. And so within the New Testament, elder is always plural in a singular church. You see, presbyteros used in the plural applied to ecclesia, the singular church, all throughout the New Testament. And this means that the New Testament model of church leadership always consists, always consists of a plural group of men set aside as elders in each singular church. On Paul's first missionary journey, he and Barnabas appointed elders for them in every church, Acts 14, 23. At the end of his third journey, Paul summoned the elders of the church to come and join him in Acts 20, 17. And they were exhorted to shepherd, that word that we see used interchangeably, pastor, shepherd the church of God in Acts 20, 28. He writes in uh, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders, plural, who rule well, be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. In James, James writes, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, James 5, 14. Just a few examples. And the New Testament evidence indicates that every church had a plurality of elders. Every church. And there is no, there's no example in the New Testament of one elder or one single pastor leading a congregation as the sole or primary leader. And it does not provide a specific number, but we see that multiple, at least two, was the New Testament pattern. One other important thing to note pertaining to churches like ours in our own context with paid staff is that not not all elders are staff members. You see, many churches may look at their church staff and say that they have a plurality because we have multiple people who we uh, hire who, who are paid staff members, but this is not necessarily the case. You see, not all elders are staff members, just as not all staff members should be elders, and not all elders should be staff members what we call lay elders, men in the church who serve as an elder but have other jobs. They're not paid by the church. And there are certain elders for sure that serve as staff members, but not all staff members must be elders. And so it's better to leave the eldership open to anyone who aspires to the office and is qualified to serve, whether they are employed by the church or not. It's important, I thought, for our context. And so in the New Testament model, we see a plurality applied to the singular church. Now, the next observation I want to make pertains to one of the reasons elders are mentioned in the plural. It's not just mentioned in the plural so that one specific group can make all of the decisions in the church. That's actually contrary to what the New Testament teaches, as the New Testament maintains congregational authority. But one of the primary reasons for the plurality of elders within the New, Church, the New Testament is for pastoral help and accountability for the health of the church. Pastoral health, help and accountability for the health of the church. You see, this one might go without saying, 
But I think it's helpful to stop here for a minute. I think it's helpful to consider what a plurality, how a plurality helps each other, a plurality of pastors, elders, opposed to a lone pastor. You see, we've all heard the all-too-common story of pastors falling into sin that in turn is detrimental and has detrimental effects on the church. Much of the time, pastors fall into into church-altering sin because they lack accountability. They're on an island by themselves. They're they're on their own. They're making decisions on their own. They've got no accountability around them. And I think we could all agree that without accountability, we're more prone to fall into sin. And so when there's a single pastor, or pastors, excuse me, either fall into sin or fall into depression because they lack health, You see, when there is a single pastor within the church, that pastor is generally expected to be multi-talented with all of the skills to carry out every ministry within the church. If you go on spc.net, Southern Baptist Convention website, and you go to job search, and you look at all of these uh, job openings, these pastor job openings, and you you click on the, uh, or you look at the part where it says uh, uh, responsibilities, you see like 30 things listed that a pastor's supposed to be able to do. Well, I got news for you. No single pastor can do all 30 of those things because he's not gifted in every way. He's not gifted to carry those things out. And then the reality is no single guy is gifted enough to carry out all of those things within a single church. And therefore, a solid portion of pastors fall into depression or fall into sin because so many are critical of whether he's checking all the boxes on that list. Did you know that one in five pastors battle clinical depression and mental illness? Did you know that? And that number's growing. Much of the time, it's the result of the pressure often put on them to be a jack-of-all-trades and a single leader within a congregation. Church isn't growing. Whose fault is it? You know, we look at things like that, and pastors feel that weight. And one of the reasons God established a plurality within the New Testament is for help and accountability. Help and accountability. But God's design for his church is that there is a multiplicity of elders, pastors within a congregation to help one another and hold each other accountable. All equal. All equal. I may not have survived the last four years, three years without Philip because of accountability, because of help. Bearing burdens. It's for the spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional well-being of the men God has called to lead his church. None of us can do this life on our own. And no single pastor can thrive on his own. There are numerous responsibilities within the church of God that elders are called to carry out. And so with this, it's no wonder that in God's infinite wisdom for the local church that he has designed it to be led by a plurality of leaders who share the burden of ministry for the spiritual well-being of Christ's church. And as it relates to pastoral responsibilities, no one person has all the gifts or time necessary to provide all that the congregation needs. Pastors try to carry those things out, and pastors eventually neglect their families. It's really staggering how many families are torn apart by ministry. Pastors might be gifted in one area, but lacking in another. Some are especially gifted at preaching and teaching, others in administration, others in counseling, others in discipling. And within a team of elders, other elders who balance the deficiencies uh, of another man's weaknesses. It's very important. We all have weaknesses. We all do. And it allows each elder to focus upon his specific calling and gifting instead of spending large amounts of time and energy in areas of ministry that are not his gifting. Further, as I've mentioned, it provides accountability. While having a plurality does not guarantee the church leadership will not encounter problems, it certainly will, but it offers a safeguard for pastors and for the church. Provides a safeguard. You see, it protects a single pastor from error with too much authority and a little accountability. And this type of accountability also helps foster maturity. Maturity. 
and godliness among the elders. And as elders serve and lead together, they will often be challenged by the godly examples of the others that they see in each other. You see, pastors need help, and pastors need accountability, and God's design helps to foster this atmosphere. And again, there's so much more that we could say on that, but let's keep moving. So let's consider the second office mentioned by Paul. We see overseers, plurality, elder, like we just mentioned. He also lists deacons. You know, that's one of the common questions when you talk about a plurality of elders and deacons, especially in churches in context like ours or a lot of Southern Baptist churches. How do elders and deacons relate to one another? Well, it is interesting that for the last hundred or so years within the Baptist church, you see a plurality of deacons, but you don't see a plurality of elders. You have a lot of theories and some history to back it up, but we don't have time for that. But you see a plurality of deacons, but not a plurality of elders, and it would make for a good history lesson one day. But in most Baptist churches like ours, deacons have somewhat occupied this plurality of elder type role. Many churches have looked at deacons in a capacity similar to what I've just explained with elders. But what we've seen today and what we see is in God's design within the New Testament church is there is a plurality of elders and there is also a plurality of deacons within each singular congregation. And so if there is a distinction in elders and deacons, how do the two relate to one another? And so my next observation, biblical eldership promotes the biblical role of deacons for the health of the church. Biblical eldership promotes the biblical role of deacons for the health of the church. Ask any pastor or ask any member of a church about deacons and you'll get some kind of horror story. (laughs) You always get jokes about the pastor's kid and the deacon's kid out behind the church before the service, you know. There might be some truth to that, by the way. But someone always has a story about deacons running off pastors. Deacons fighting before the church service. Deacons running the show, and on and on and on it goes. You see, deacons get a bad reputation quite often. Now, let me say this. This church, First Baptist Church, Olo, has a phenomenal group of deacons. You can rest assured. This church has a phenomenal group of deacons. Our deacons love God. Our deacons love this church. Our deacons serve this church unconditionally, and they want, uh, they want to see God do a work in this place. We don't fight at deacons' meetings. You hear those stories. That's not us. We don't fight at deacons meetings. We don't yell at each other. We all want what God wants at First Baptist Church Olo. Now, we might have different ideas of how to get there and have friendly debate, but we all have the same goal, your pastors and deacons. And I praise God for the deacons of this church. I I say that with the utmost sincerity. Praise God for them. These last five months would have been impossible without them. Completely impossible. And so with this in mind, one of the reasons deacons have gotten a bad rap is because many of these things that I've mentioned are indeed true. You've heard the stories because they're true that deacons ran off the pastor. You've heard the stories that deacons were fighting before the church because they are true, whatever the case may be. Or deacons have run the show how they wanted, and deacons have created trouble, whatever the case may be. But I'm going to give deacons some grace by saying this may not be entirely their fault. This may not be entirely their fault. These stories and what's transpired is not entirely their fault. You see, the common denominator is most of these stories in most of these stories, is that churches have asked deacons to occupy a role that God has not called them to occupy. Most of them, because churches have placed deacons in this quasi-elder role, many deacons have been asked to carry out responsibilities that God doesn't ask of them, that God has not placed upon them. And many churches have asked deacons to carry out responsibilities that God has not gifted them to carry out. And so, in too many SBC churches, deacons have been elevated to the place of elder, something that God has not done, but churches have done. 
And they work as a plurality. They make decisions that elders are specifically called to make. They seek to shepherd in ways in which only elders are equipped to shepherd. And they've done a stand-up job doing something that God doesn't even ask of them. And so when a lot of conflict happens in churches related to deacons, it's my own theory, but I think it may be fairly accurate, it is because churches have asked them to do something that God has not asked them to do. And it's created frustration. It's created friction. It'd be like you putting me in a position at NASA and insisting that I build a rocket that will travel to the moon. I took college algebra three times. You think I can put together the numbers to get the rocket, one, to put it together, two, to get it in the sky and in that little window you have to get through to get into space and all that. Well, if you do that and tell me to do that, I'm going to get frustrated because I don't possess the ability to do that. And a solid portion of the time, deacons have done their best to fulfill this role, and they've done great at it. But churches have asked things of their deacons that the Lord does not ask of them. And it can create frustration and friction. But God's design for leadership in his church is a plurality of elders because having a healthy plurality of elders promotes the biblical role of deacons. Well, how so? Well, the biblical role of deacons is to care for the physical and logistical needs of the church that enables the elders to concentrate on their primary calling, the spiritual things of the church. And so to ask, to ask the other of deacons is unfair to them. And this is what led to the institution of the first deacons in Acts chapter 6. The first seven deacons were, uh, were needed to allow the apostles the freedom to continue with their work. Now, deacons differ than elders in qualification and function. We don't have time to go into all that, but they do. And having a plurality of elders frees up deacons from trying to balance the elder responsibilities. And having a plurality of deacons frees the elders from trying to balance the deacon responsibilities. Frees them up to do what God's called them and equipped them to do and gifted them to do. Why? Because elders and deacons mutually need each other. They need each other. It's a relationship that helps each other. It's a relationship that enables the other to flourish. Like husband and wife, the husband occupying his God-given role, the wife occupying her God-given role. They need each other to occupy those roles to flourish as a couple and as a family. Deacons are to care for the facilities as they are responsible for the basic management of church property. Deacons are the primary contributors, distributors excuse me, of benevolence and involved in administer, administrating funds to the needy. We see that in Acts 6. Deacons oversee matters of church finances. Deacons should be available to help in a variety of log, logistical ways so that the elders are able to concentrate on the teaching and shepherding of the church. And this way, deacons can fully carry out their God-given responsibilities and elders can carry out theirs for the overall health of the church. Whereas elders are charged with the task of teaching and shepherding the church, deacons are given a more service-oriented function, the basis of their name, servant, caring for matters related more to the physical or temporal concerns of the church. And both elders and deacons are a gift to the church for the health of the congregation. We need both. They're a gift, God's gift to the church for the health of the congregation. Now, one final note. God's given model for church leadership does not undermine or undercut congregational authority. I know a lot of times when we have conversations about elders or anything like that, they go, well, you're, you, you just want to have this group of people that make all the decisions and the church has no say or whatever the case may be. That's not, that's not true, and that's, that's contrary to what the New Testament teaches. The authority of elders is balanced by the authority of the congregation as a whole. But we must never forget, here's the important thing as we talk about this, we must never forget that we all operate under the ultimate authority of Jesus Christ and his word. This is Christ's church. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's not our church. It's Christ's church. He is the head of the church. He is our ultimate authority. His word is our sole source of authority. It's what we have. 
everything should be done under his authority because Jesus is the head of the body, the church. This is why, listen, this is why it is important for us to recognize God's prescription for church leadership as found in Philippians 1 and throughout the whole New Testament. It's very important. Why? Because it's Christ's church. We have Scripture. We go back to Scripture. We go back to Scripture. What does Scripture say? What does Scripture say? What does Scripture say? What does Scripture say? That's our question. That's our question. That's how we answer our questions. What does Scripture say? And if this church is under the sole authority of Jesus Christ and His Word, what does Jesus and His Word tell us about how our leadership is to be structured at First Baptist Olo? This is a valid question that we all need to ask ourselves. You see, I've had conversations about biblical eldership with many of you. I've encountered, because we've encountered this teaching many times in our journey through Scripture over the last 12 years since I've been here. I've taught it on Wednesday nights because we've studied the church and how Christ has set up His church. I've had numerous conversations with many of you, many within our church, about how God has designed leadership within his church. But the reason that I wanted to stop here and look at these these two offices from Philippians chapter 1 is because now is the time that we start this conversation as a whole, as a congregation. Had a lot of little uh, conversations. We've had some teaching here and there. But now is the time that we start this conversation as a whole, as a congregation. Now, I'm not saying this happens overnight or within the next year, but it's something that we need to be asking of ourselves if we want to align with God's Word. And now is the time that we start this conversation. Today is only the beginning of an overall conversation, of the overall conversation, as there are many more questions that I'm unable to answer in this short time. But First Baptist Church Olo, if we want church revitalization and to be aligned with God's Word in every area of our church, it, it is important that this be a vital starting point for us. A vital starting point, something to consider as we look for that. This is not about power. It's not about status. It's not about looking this way. It's not about looking that way. This is about yielding to God's word for the overall health of his church. God put a blueprint for us in the word because he knows what's best for his church. And this is his church. And I think it would be good for us to yield to God's word for the overall health of this church. If God says the church should be structured this way so that the church will spiritually flourish, that is something that I want to get on board with. Something I want to get on board with. And I hope that you do too. And so let us follow Christ in his plan for his church at First Baptist Olo. Now if you're watching this sermon and you do not know Jesus, I would ask you today to turn from your sin and follow Christ. As I mentioned earlier, this world is full of hopelessness, and there's only one source of true hope in all of creation, and that's Jesus Christ. In God's infinite wisdom, as he is perfect, holy, righteous, everything that you're not and everything I'm not, man's sinned, we're all born dead in our trespasses and sins, unable to know God, enemies of God. We're not just halfway good. There is none good. No, not one. Not one is righteous, Paul would say. We're all dead in our trespasses and sins, following the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan. By nature, children of wrath. Bad news. But the good news is God didn't leave us on our own to figure out this this whole thing. God sent Jesus Christ. God didn't ask us to do X, Y, and Z in order to earn our salvation. God sent Jesus Christ, and God said, Turn from your sin and trust in Christ, and you'll be saved. So if you've never trusted Christ, turn from your sin, trust in Christ, and receive this salvation. And first, Baptist Solo, let us be a people that trust Christ in every area of our lives and in every area of our church. Pray with me.